Good morning. While you're standing, would you open your Bibles, if you have them with you, to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. This morning I'm going to be speaking on one of my favorite subjects, wisdom. And we're going to be talking about King Solomon. King Solomon was David and Bathsheba's son, so he was born out of sin. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and he's the one that David, Solomon's father, sent into battle to be killed to cover up his sin. And yet, as you hear this story, you're going to see that it was, it was the, the grace of God, it was the will of God, that Solomon become a mighty man of God. Solomon was the third and final king of the United Kingdom of Israel, and he reigned for 40 years. After that, Israel was divided. Okay, let's begin with 1 Kings. Most all of my scriptures today will be from the New Living Translation, and I have quite a few of them, so if you don't want to keep turning, they'll be on the uh, boards in the front and the back. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and not, have, and not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you ask for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart and such as no one else has had or ever will have. But then God went on to say in, in verse 13, And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. You may be seated. Father, I pray you set me aside right now, Lord. Bind my mouth, bind my thoughts, my words. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Give us all a heart, Lord, towards you, ears to hear your voice, eyes to see and understand what you are saying. And then, Lord, give us the, the desire and the ability to go forth and put it into practice. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message today is Wisdom, the Bridge Between Start and Finish. The book of Proverbs, much of it was written by Solomon, it defines wisdom. And many times you can read Proverbs probably every day of your life and still learn and still grow and still find all the areas you fall short. It is a great book. It's a great gauge for us to know where we stand in doing the things that God commands us to do. And it also gives us hints and tips on how to do them and how to save ourselves an awful lot of misery. Wisdom is applied knowledge, and all wisdom comes from God. You know, there were many philosophers who thought that they were wise, but any wisdom that might have come out of their mouth did not originate with them. It came from God. Wisdom enables us to make decisions that honor God and decisions that agree with his word. And most of all, wisdom helps us to make decisions that are good for us. And that's a concept that gets lost often. We think God is asking us to do things or telling us to go a certain direction to make life harder, to make us miserable. But it's in reality, every decision that you take to God and pass, pass to him to, to get his approval of, every decision, when you hear his answer and you follow his way, it is good for you. It is good for your life. Wisdom is a gift from God available to us all. 
Wisdom helps us make genuinely Holy Spirit-led decisions, and they always have a favorable outcome. Now, that's not to say every decision you make has a favorable outcome, that has a favorable outcome, is godly or Holy Spirit-led. We all can probably think of a decision or two we've made in our lives that wasn't the best, but the mercy or the grace of God allowed things to work out for us. But we know, and we knew at the time, that perhaps it wasn't the best decision, and we thank God for that grace or mercy. Often we make decisions based on selfish or fleshly desires. And sometimes they work out, not because we acted in wisdom, but because of God's grace and mercy. But eventually, we all find ourselves at a point making decisions in haste without the counsel of the Lord, and then they come back to bite us. And they often result in making a mess of things, or worse, having to face serious consequences for those decisions. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 3, and let's look at what wisdom, the wisdom that God bestowed on Solomon, let's look at how, how it got put into action. Beginning at verse 16. Sometime later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them began, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were only the two of us in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. Then the other woman interrupted, It certainly was your son, and the living child is mine. No, the first woman said, The living child is mine, and the dead one is yours. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then the king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours. And each says that the dead one belongs to the other. All right, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two and give half to one woman and half to the other. Then the woman who was the real mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh no, my lord, give her the child. Please do not kill him. But the other woman said, All right, he will be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, Do not kill the child, but give him to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. When all Israel heard the king's decision, the people were in awe of the king. For they saw the wisdom of God had given, the, the wisdom God had given him for rendering justice. So by all accounts, Solomon's early life as a king was, was one of great success. The Bible tells us under his rule, the people of Israel prospered, they were blessed, and they lived in peace. 1 Kings chapter 4, 29, uh, verses 29 through 34 tell us, God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite, the son of Mahal, Heman, Calcol, and Darda. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs, and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from the great cedars of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grew from the cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, small creatures, and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And 1 Kings 10.23 says, King Solomon became richer and wiser than any other king on earth. There wasn't a thing that King Solomon lacked. And everything that he had was in, in great measure. He had multitudes of riches, multitudes of blessings, anything his heart desired. And Solomon was a humble man. And he was well aware of his shortcomings. We see that in the, in the first passage we read where he's telling God, these are your people, and I'm just like a kid here. I don't know what to do. So I'm, the one thing, he could have asked for anything. And the one thing he asked for 
was wisdom. He acknowledged his inability to rule because he knew he was human and he knew that without God, he would fall flat on his face. Solomon was very unselfish. He was a generous man. Scripture demonstrates Solomon started out his reign very well. And as king, he obeyed God and God's favor was upon him. Early in his reign, he heeded the counsel of his father, David. And right before David died, he, he gave words of wisdom to uh, Solomon. And we find those in 1 Kings chapter 2. If we'll just go back and look at 1 Kings chapter 2 and see what his dad said. 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 1 says, At the time of King David's death, as, as the time of King David's death approached, he gave this charge to his son Solomon. I am going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all his ways. Keep the decrees, commands, regulations, and laws written in the law of Moses so that, so that why? So that you will be successful in all you do and wherever you go. We hear those words again in the book of Joshua. And then, as was the pattern of so many in that day, and no different from the pattern we see in the lives of Christians today, Solomon went from daily seeking and honoring the Lord, being wholly devoted to the Lord and obedient to his statutes, to slowly inclining his heart towards fleshly desires. Straying from his own counsel and from the wisdom of Scripture, he began chasing after the things his heart desired that were of this world. In Deuteronomy 17, God laid out the parameters of what a king should do, the, the rules, the regulations a king should follow. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 says, You are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses, for the Lord has told you you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That's a tall order. But God surely blessed Solomon. And with all those riches and all those blessings, I would think that in our natural way of looking at things, we, we'd keep that, as I'm sure Solomon thought he would as well. That way, he will learn to fear the Lord, his God, by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. So over time, God had given clear instructions for anyone who would be king. He said, no amassing of horses, no multiplying of wives, no accumulating of silver and gold. These commands were designed to prevent the king from trusting in military might, or following foreign gods, or relying on wealth instead of God. And then we read in 1 Kings chapter 11 that Solomon took 700 wives. And as if that wasn't enough for any man, he added to it 300 concubines, which are mistresses. <laughs> 700 wives <laughs> and 300 mistresses. And what did God say? Take none of them. This was in direct violation of God's word. It's somehow ironic to think that this is the same man who wrote the book of the Song of Solomon, which presents a beautiful picture of what God intends marriage to be. 
So Solomon wrote the, the book in the Bible called Song of Solomon. Solomon wrote that. And it's about marriage, marriage between one man and one woman. <laughs> and yet here we see him now with 700 wives and 300 mistresses. Obviously, King Solomon knew what was right, even if he didn't always do what was right. Now let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 11 and, and see what, what happened to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 11, first, verses 1 through 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David had done. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He went from worshiping God, asking God for wisdom, to serving pagan gods. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. The Lord was very angry with Solomon, for his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods. But Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and you have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. The women who Solomon loved and married against God's will did indeed turn his heart away from God. Solomon wasn't a puppet king. He had free will, just as we do. God did not force him to do what was right, just as he doesn't force us. God laid out his will. God blessed Solomon with wisdom. God blessed him with riches. And God expected him to obey. Yet after years of walking with and basking in the blessings of God, he wasn't a newborn Christian. He wasn't a babe in Christ or just came to know the Lord. 20 years he, he was just living for the Lord, and everybody prospered, and blessings upon blessings came on, on, upon Israel because he walked with them for, for a very long period of time, which makes it just amazing to me that after so long and seeing the results of, of serving and being obedient to God, how flesh, how flesh can rise up and suddenly take you down a whole different road. We see that today, and we often go, how can they do that? And we all, we've heard of preachers that have, have risen up who had such an anointing on their, their, their lives, such an anointing on their preaching, and then we read or hear about things that they've done, and, and we can't wrap our, our minds around it. But we see a pattern of it right here, and what wisdom tells me is it is part of our flesh. It is something to watch out for. It is something to always be on the lookout for. Because we're no different. Solomon had it all. I mean, God, the, the scriptures went on to say how much wisdom he had, how much riches he had, how he had everything, how in his command over the people, they had everything. And yet he fell. I think it's a, it's a lesson for us to, to not look at these people and go, how in the world could they do that? As much as we need to look at them and say, these were, these were people... God visited him twice, <laughs> and yet he went from one extreme to the other. After years of walking with and basking in the blessings, there came a time when Solomon made the choice to disobey, and that's what it was, a choice. And there also came a day when God held him accountable for that choice. First Kings 
Chapter 11, verse 9 says, the Lord was very angry with Solomon. He wasn't just angry, he was very angry with him. And in verse 11, the Lord said to Solomon, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. So now fast forward with me to the end of Solomon's life, and we see God use him to write one more book of the Bible. The book of Ecclesiastes gives us the rest of the story. Throughout this book, Solomon tells us everything he tried in order to find fulfillment apart from God in this life. And this is his own testimony, his own testimony in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. These are his words. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 8. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasures of many kings and provinces, I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish... It was all so meaningless. Like chasing the wind, there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. And at the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, we find wise counsel again. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, and I'll read this one from the Amplified Version. When all has been heard, the end of the matter is, fear God, worship him with awe-filled reverence, knowing that he is Almighty God. Keep his commandments, for this applies to every person. Amen. It's never God's will for anyone to sin, but he does allow us to make choices. We'd be a bunch of robots. We would just have no, no thoughts, no, no any, any part of us to, to make us individuals from each other. We'd just be a collective group that did and said everything God told us to. And, and there wouldn't be any joy in that. But, and God didn't want that. He didn't want a bunch of robots that just did what he told them. But he laid out, in this book of the Bible, he laid out the instructions for a successful life. He gave us everything we need. He gave us, he, he looked ahead and saw and knew, because he formed us, he knew our frame. So he knew our pitfalls. And he told us ahead of time, don't do this, because it may lead to that. Don't do that because it may lead to this. Make sure you do this. He gave us everything we needed, but he gave us free will. The story of Solomon is a powerful lesson for us all, and it tells us the, the consequences of disobedience. And it also tells us it's not enough to start well. We must endure and we must end well. And that's where we see throughout the word as times get tough on this earth and we see those things happening right now. If you started out in the word, you know, train up a child in the way they should go and when they're old they won't depart from it. If you started in a church and you started under, under teachings and preachings in the word of God, that is wonderful because you have that foundation. But you still have that free choice. And it's going to be much more important that you finish well. Because God doesn't bless the start. <laughs> he blesses the finish. Amen. Life without God is a dead-end street. Right. Whatever pleasures Solomon sought after and indulged in, eventually he realized they were not worth the price he paid. Amen. A wiser Solomon concluded in Ecclesiastes 12.8 that his life of pleasure was completely meaningless. We sometimes think, if only, if only I had enough money to buy that house. If only I had that job. If only I had. And, and that is just a, a, it's a trap. It's a trap of our flesh. Because the reality is, all those if onlys will never. Look what Solomon had. If anyone had a reason to be happy and joyful forever, it was Solomon. He had everything he wanted. And he ended up miserable. <laughs> and that's the lesson that we have to get, that... that those things, pleasures of this life, things that the moment we take our last breath disappear, will not give us lasting happiness. Right. We may enjoy them for the moment, but they're here and they're gone, just like we are. 
The book of Ecclesiastes ends with this warning in verse 14. For God will bring every act to judgment, every hidden and secret thing, whether it is good or evil. Now, James, in the book of James, in in chapter 1, verse 5, God says, if you need wisdom, ask. Ask our generous God, and he will give it to you, and he will not rebuke you for asking. God gives liberally, meaning the well, his reservoir of wisdom is never ending for you and I. And, you know, I look back over my life, and I, I used to joke that my mom died when I was 29, but I look back at when I was a child growing up in the house, and I say that I don't know that I had any regular conversations with my mom. They were all her talking in Proverbs. I mean, I remember them all. I cried because I had no shoes, and then I met a man who had no feet. Or, you know, what? don't cry over spilled milk. Let's cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> Uh, why worry about tomorrow? There's plenty of trouble for today. <laughs> and on and on and on. And it's funny how I, I, oh, that's what I remember of my mom. But I also know that I spent 25 years, probably closer to 30, out there in the wilderness where I did not operate in any wisdom at all. And when I came to the Lord, wisdom became rich to me because all of those things came back to my remembrance. And my mom was a very wise woman. And she spoke those things, and they stuck, even if I wasn't living them or following them. And then I read the word, and I go into the book of Proverbs, and I love that. I just love it, because it is truth. And, and for, for someone who, you know, I've always said I'm, I'm emotionally lazy. I don't expend emotions very easily. I'm not going to get all upset over something. I'm not going to jump up and down and go crazy. That's, that's, I'm, t- I'm emotionally lazy. I like to stay even keeled. <laughs> And it's the same thing. I don't want to have to pick myself back up after following this path or that path and go through all of these things that a person has to do when I've read the book and I know what happens. That's not to say I don't sin, but I look for ways to see that someone else showed me the lesson, and then I ask God, let me learn from their lesson. That's good enough for me. I don't have to experience it for myself. And Solomon's one of those people that I think, you know, you see that he had it all. It's our nature to want more. It's always our nature to want the next best thing. But it doesn't necessarily bring you joy. And if you read the rest of the book of Kings, you'll notice two things. Solomon experiences the same sins that his father did. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Solomon was a murderer and an adulterer. And Solomon's children repeat the process, just as David's children Solomon's life was perfect. He had money, he had women, he had power, and unprecedented peace. He never suffered. Solomon didn't suffer, but his children suffered his consequences instead, just as David's children suffered the consequences. His children, Solomon's children, died horrible deaths in war and famine. The nation of Israel was completely destroyed because of his sin and foolishness. Sin affects generations. If you're an alcoholic, your children by nature, now understand I'm saying by nature, are more prone to alcoholism. Doesn't mean they're going to or have to become alcoholics. But without God, if you were born into a family of alcoholics, it will be your nature to, to be, have, have uh, the proclivity towards that sin that is generational. If, you're a, if you are abusive, your children by nature will be prone to abuse or abusive relationships. If you reject Jesus or walk away from God, there's a good chance your children will do the same. The only way to break the curse of sin is through repentance. Thank God for Jesus. His righteousness covers our sins. But if we never repent, if we never bring them before the Lord and ask for that forgiveness, we don't just automatically have it because Jesus died. It is a personal decision each of us must make. And it's a step that you can't skip because repentance is what moves God's heart. It's why he sent Jesus. It's why Jesus died on the cross and rose again. So that by his righteousness, we could be made righteous. I believe the greatest takeaway, though, from the life of Solomon is this. Our finish is much more important than our start. And wisdom is the bridge that spans our start to finish. 
seeking God daily for the decisions to be made each day, just as, as yesterday's faith doesn't carry you into today. Right. Every day we need, we need to renew our faith, renew our minds. Every day our prayers from yesterday don't carry us for the rest of our lives. Right. We pray daily. Right. We come before the Lord, we repent daily. His mercies are new every morning. A walk with the Lord is continual. It is not hurry up and get through the process and call it good. We have, to, we have to understand that when we miss a day, okay, it may not be a big deal. We all do. And we may even miss two. But I think we are all mature enough to understand when we miss a few days in a row, it changes our, our attitude with people. It changes our outlook on things. We are easily swayed by things we hear that we might not otherwise be if we were shored up in the word of God that morning. You know, God, God puts a protection around us through his word. But if we don't seek it daily, it's not just going to automatically follow us through all the days of our lives. So seeking God daily for those decisions and applying godly wisdom to those decisions And doing it from start to finish will allow us to hear these words when we finally reach that finish line. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Walking in wisdom at the start is good, but finishing with wisdom is not just better, it's vital. And not just for us, but for our children and for anyone under our influence. We don't realize how many people we affect People in our families, people maybe we work with, people who look up to us, our actions have consequences. And they're not consequences for us alone. They are also for those who are watching us. And too often people don't recognize their sin affects others to a great degree. Not just a little bit, but to a great degree. For, for all whose lives are influenced by us, for all who, who watch us, for all who we uh, preach to or talk to or pray for, if not for ourselves, we need to recognize today especially because there's a whole world out there preaching against God. And if we try to tell our children all about the goodness of God and yet we don't live as if God is good, Our words are futile. Children do not hear us as much as they watch us. You know, I read something recently about, it was uh, was telling us really, you, you should never send your children off to school yelling at them, and you should never put them to bed yelling at them. And you know how many families do that? It's sad, but a lot, you know, kids need nurturing but they also need models that, role models that actually do what they say. And far too many families today have parents who are ordering them around and whose lives are a total mess. Our children, grandchildren, people under our influence are watching. We call ourselves Christians. We need to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And in the words of Jesus, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Amen? Amen. Amen.